Aegeus. And guess what he says? You will be least in the kingdom of heaven. So at least you'll have a hope of being there, but you'll be the least. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. At least he didn't send you to Gay or Gehenna, which is a positive. <laughs> We're going to learn more about the kingdom of heaven, but that's the whole point. The important point of Christ in Matthew is, what is the most important thing to Christ in Matthew? Obviously. Well, the kingdom of heaven, but what part then? What, what is the most important thing that he is expressing about the kingdom of heaven? The law. How to get there. Huh? The law. Well, and, and he views the way to get there is through the law. The law. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. But it's interesting. The law. The context from now on, and I would, I would argue that the context for the whole of Matthew is the law. You can take that or leave it. But at least I can prove beyond a shadow of doubt in a Greek logical sense that between the verses uh, 17 and what, 7 and 12, that every single point between those two is based wholly, 100% on the law, the wow. context. Is, yes. he, is he setting the, the stage for the necessity for his crucifixion? Yes. Bingo. Beautiful. Mary, you must have read my notes from last week that I didn't explain. The 36 un, uh, unforgivables. And matter of fact, uh, if you have last week's notes, the 36 unforgivables, I don't have it memorized, I didn't have it in my notes, and I don't have my cheat sheet here. But there are 36 unforgivables that Paul writes about, and they're the 36 unforgivables that you cannot be forgiven in Jewish law for breaking those 36 things. And I gave you the list. Mm -hmm. So if you break those those things in the law, you cannot be forgiven. And by the way, and I think I gave you the quote, um, I don't have it here, but it's uh, from Leviticus, I think, the Levitical thing. The rabbis know this. There, there is no sacrifice for intentional sin, according to the rabbis. If you sin intentionally, no sacrifice will cover your skin. It's not the scape sin. The scapegoat won't. The sin sacrifice or guilt sacrifice will not cover your sin if it's intentional. So the problem is that you have 36 things that if you break, you are not forgiven. And beyond that, if you did anything intentional, now what do we know about intentional sin? All sin is intentional, guys. That, and, and okay, you have hit the point because that's what we're going to see. The next how umpteen verses that we're going to see between the, the words, between the argument, between 17 and 712, are all arguments about how the law is not sufficient. This, Paul says it outright. You see this? I told you before that the reason that, that the early church loved Paul was because they could understand what he was telling them. It's very clear. Where Christ is not being as clear. Well, in our minds, is not as clear. And in their minds, is not. In, in their minds, Christ is here, and Paul is here talking to him. See? In our minds, because of translations, we think Christ is way down here, and Paul is up here someplace. See? Yeah? But in many times in the, in the Bible, it, Christ says, after Christ has taught the multitudes, he went back and explained it to his apostles. Yes. Is that kind of why? Well, because of the difficulty and the them? I mentioned this before. The disciples are thinking dirash. They're thinking in Hebraic thought patterns, um, where he is speaking wholly in a Greek rational sense, Greek rational logical arguments. And so, yes, he had to explain this to fishermen, even though they were trained in Pharisaic thought. Matter of fact, probably because they were trained in Pharisaic thought. And remember, I told you in Mark, Mark gives us that beautiful, Mark is so beautiful as a simple Greek argument, a simplified Greek argument. Matthew is very complex. Mark is a lot simpler. But Mark gives us that beautiful demarcation between when the disciples were thinking holy derash and they started thinking rationally. When Christ said, who do people say that I am? And, the, and they, go, they go crazy. Well, you're John the Baptist, but he's dead. You're Zechariah, but he's dead. You're Isaiah, but he's dead. You're a prophet, but they're dead. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because logically, he ain't dead. 
And he's obviously been manifesting himself throughout the early part of Mark as a miracle worker, the prophetic Messiah. And so when Peter makes that statement, that is a rational, logical reply. And from that point on, Mark, or Mark changes radically, you know, in its thinking patterns. So in Mark, we see that dramatically. In Matthew, not as dramatically. Matthew is more of a Greek logical argument assuming that everyone is thinking in a Greek sense. And so he doesn't call the disciples stupid all the time, like Mark does. Mark says they were stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid heads. You know? where, where Matthew basically makes comments about you know, that he, spoke, he taught and spoke differently than the rabbis. Because he did. He's talking in a Greek rational sense, logical sense, rather than in that other thing. So, in any case, the context now is going to be the law. And the kingdom of heaven is, the, you can't ever forget the kingdom of heaven, because the kingdom of heaven is coming, and, and the kingdom of heaven, when the kingdom of heaven comes, what is the advent, what is the advent of the kingdom of heaven, according to Matthew? The law. The law is there as a day, but the way that you'll know it is because the law. We'll see more indications of that. In any case, um, for I tell you that unless, this is 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness, your diakasune, and that's why, you know, I don't like righteousness. Let's get rid of that word, equity. Your diakasune, your equity, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the grammateus. Literally, this is the writers, not, well, it says literally the writers of the law. Okay, who are the Pharisees? That's that sect, right, the, the rabbinical sect. And the teachers, basically the Pharisees, they believe, and this is really important. If I'm going to write down here what the Pharisees, the big P's, what do they hold to? They hold to number one, Torah, and they hold to number two, what? Mishnah, Mishnah, and number three, they hold to Talmud, Talmud, so they got Torah, they got Mishnah, Mishnah is the oral Torah, and they got the commentary around the Torah, that's the Pharisees, so what Christ is telling them is unless your righteousness, your diakasune, your balance, is better than the guys who are basically involved with Torah, Mishnah, and Talmud. But then he also says, and the writers of the law. What is the law? The Torah. And what does he mean? It's very obvious what he means in the Hebraic sense, because the Mishnah, is the Mishnah written down at this point? No. No. It is only done orally until about 100 AD when they wrote the Mishnah down. The Mishnah and Talmud were never written down. So when he says the, the writers, the grammateus of the law, he is indicating those who wrote or, or do the Torah. Who is he secretly talking about here? Moses. Who? Moses. Say, I, I say God. <coughs> no, he's talking about a, a group. A group in the four sects. Take your pick. The four sects. The Pharisees. No, he just mentioned the Pharisees. He's talking about the what? The Sadducees. The Sadducees. It has to be the Sadducees because the Sadducees held that only the Torah, only the written law, was the thing. Now, why would this be? Why would he secretly, why would he not say Sadducees right out, off, right? Why? Talking to them. Well, he could be talking to them. They're the priests, okay? And he's going to talk a little bit about the holy temple. So, isn't this interesting that Matthew right now, and we're going to see, I don't remember if Matthew gets down on the uh, Sadducees, but in Matthew, he's not mentioning the Sadducees by name yet, but he means them. It's obvious he means them, because that's what the grammateus of the law would be. So in any case, he says, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, actually, it's, it's not enter, be a part of the kingdom of heaven. So you got to be better. And what is he automatically telling you? Who's not in the kingdom of heaven? Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees. <laughs> the priests. And that may be why he didn't want to say that, because the priests, you know, right. 22. But I lego you. I hate this. They say tell you. I lego you that anyone, and this is where we start to get to really interesting stuff. This is so mistranslated, it makes me want to have an issue. 
Uh, I tell you, I lego you, that anyone who is orgizo provokes. Any, it's not angry. It's anyone who orgizo. Uh, we, get, we get a lot of words from this in English, like uh, uh, orgizo. Uh, well, you can guess. Anyway, we get a lot of words from this, but anyone who, who provokes or enrages, it's not make angry, it's provokes or enrages, with his brother, it's Oedipus, uh, of the same womb, without cause, E.K. is in there, without cause. The King James is right, the NIV is completely wrong. The NIV leaves that out. It says, anyone who provokes his brother without cause, without cause, will be subject to judgment. And by the way, this is, a, not, this is not Corneo. The word judgment is the word for judgment, and I didn't look it up. But anyway, it's, it's judgment. It means to be judged by a judge. Anyone who says, past tense, to his brother, Raka. Now, didn't you ever always wonder, didn't you ask your Sunday school teacher, teacher, what does Raka mean? <laughs> because if you do it, you're toast, right? Because it says you will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is that 70, that group of 70. Pharisees, mostly Sadducees, there's 70 of them, mostly Sadducees priests, and four of them that we know of are Pharisees in this period. So the Sanhedrin. Raka is the great curse in Hebrew, in Hebrew culture. So the great curse literally is to say the worthless one. But listen to what it says. But anyone who says moros, moros, you dumb, non-speaking one. Do you see this parallel? Raka means is the great curse where you say someone is worthless. But then he goes on to say anyone who says it's not fool, it's moros. Remember what did I tell you the the functional meaning of moros is in this culture. He goes back to the mysterium. It literally means one who will not speak or speak out. So whenever you see the word moros used, I mean, I, there's lots of words. It's like French. I mean, I don't think Greek has as many words in French where you can say bad things about people. <laughs> but there's a lot of them. You have a lot of choices. Moros is just one of them. If I choose moros... And I've, he's used it three times already. If I choose moros over any other word, I am indicating what? The mysterium, the muo, the silence of the initiative. So what is he referring to here? He's referring to judging of those who have followed Hellenistic paths. So he says, if you, who says you fool, moros, you dumb one from mysterium, you will be in danger of, look what it says, pure, Remember, pure is what? Fire caused by lightning from Zeus. Do you see this? Who is going to take revenge? Well, not, not the God of the Hebrews. The God of the Greeks. Do you see this? This is, you know, we miss this because we get this translation. We say, well, you know, we need, somebody needs right there. The fire of Zeus, Right? or fire as a result of the lightning of Zeus, if you want to be most specific, will be in the danger of the pure of Gehenna. 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 Fires of hell. Zeus's fires of hell. woo -hoo! What did he just say about the Greek worldview? Where do you go when you die in your Greek? Hades. Hades. Yeah. Gehenna. Actually, Hades and Gehenna are different places. Gehenna, isn't it wild? that Christ did not use the word Hades here. He used the word Gehenna. Gehenna means, literally, the soil of the valley of Hena. But it, it means, in Hebraic culture, hell. So instead of using Hades, he used Gehenna, which is also a code word, because he also means Hades. It's obvious what he means. But he says the pure, so he's equating Zeus with hell. He's equating following Greek gods with hell. He's equating the Sanhedrin with the Greek gods mm -hmm. and hell. He's, you know, this is, a, this is just, you know, the depth of what he 